So hello everyone, thanks for joining our track on wearables redefining healthcare. We're delighted to be back at the Giant Health Show again this year for the third year running. And we have five sessions of really exciting speakers lined up for you. We're taking the round table format, so we'll have a person chairing the session and we'll talk around a theme for each of the sessions. And, uh, and we'll have a, spe a section at the end of that for questions where you guys can all um, link into us and, uh, and ask us questions and we'll put those to the panel live um, on the day of the show. So um, we are a design and development company and Thrive have been working around the world of health and wellness for quite some time and working on wearable technologies has really gone through some incredible changes over the last few years. And we're really excited to be now um, at a point where we're really having impact and creating some wearable technology products um, that really help to um, enhance people's lives and to um, provide provide uh, preventative and predict predictive healthcare opportunities. Um, if you want to connect with us or any of the speakers at our sessions, please go to thrivewearables.com slash giant2020, where you can get information about all the speakers and connect with our team and with the team um, who are involved with the show. Um, this session coming up today is called Muscle Stimulation for Rehabilitation and Recovery. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Barbara Shepherd to introduce and to run that panel discussion today. Uh, Barbara is the Head of Business Engagement at Manchester Fashion Institute and the Chair of the Steering Committee of the eTextile Network in the UK. Um, Barbara, welcome to the Thrive Wearables track and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks Jacob um, uh, and um, I'd just like to say uh, to everybody in the audience and the panel it's a real pleasure uh, to be working with uh, the team today. There's expertise across academia and industry uh, which for me is really important because it's a combination of all of all of us working together and hopefully in the audience we'll have members from KTN and Innovate UK because there is funding available for all of us to work collaboratively together to the benefit of the sector. So what I'd uh, like to do now is then introduce you to the panel um, and I'll start off first with Dave Sandbach from Thrive. Over to you, Dave. Oh, hi. Uh, yes, I'm Dave Sandbach, Director of Innovation at Thrive Wearables. Um, I've been with the company for four years and uh, I have a personal background going back a long way into the late 90s in um, e-textiles uh, where we overcame problems of putting uh, prototypes into uh, mass production for consumer electronics um, kind of standards possibly for the first time back in 2001. Um, my name is on a number of patents in that space. Um, at, Thrive, at Thrive, we work in tandem with clients and on our own internal innovation. And we've been involved in several uh, very interesting projects in this space. Brilliant, Dave. Um, I'd now like to introduce one of our uh, leading UK academics in this field, uh, Kai Yang from the University of Southampton. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, my name is uh, Kai Yang. I'm an uh, associate professor at the University of Southampton. I have uh, worked on electronic textile for over 10 years. Uh, my research focuses really on the electronic textile-based wearable technology for healthcare. Uh, the current project I'm working on is funded by EPSRC. It's an EPSRC fellowship to develop uh, advanced uh, e-textiles for wearable therapeutic. Uh, and the initial application will be for the joint pain relief for people with osteoarthritis knee. Uh, before I was uh, principal investigator of uh, Medical Research Council funded project called the Smart Move. Uh, in the Smart Move project, uh, we develop a wearable training system for stroke uh, uplift rehabilitation. Um, apart from my academic uh, research, I also have a great passion on the enterprise uh, uh, business because to me, and the main aim of the research is to develop something that can benefit the end user. 
Uh, I co-founded a company called Smart Fabric Inks, uh, which is a Southampton University spin-out company uh, supply functional inks for print electronics and textile. And I'm also um, founder of a company called uh, eTechSense, eTechSense developer wearable eTextile for healthcare application. Uh, as Barbara also mentioned, we got the eTextile network, uh, which is a platform to bring together the academia industry and the people in other sectors uh, work together to speed up the innovation in textile. Um, thank you. Fantastic. And last but not least, I've got Phil Konofsky from Chimera. Over to you, Phil. Thanks, Barbara. Afternoon, everyone. My name is Phil Konofsky, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Chimera. I've got a background in electronic engineering and cybernetics with a research focus in uh, wearable technologies. Uh, joined Chimera back in 2015 uh, when it was still a young budding company and we're uh, since then been developing the new uh, smart garment technologies, uh, looking to develop new technologies for biomedical monitoring, uh, all embedded in smart garments. And so we have a research, we have a focus in uh, professional sports and medical applications. That's really where we, where we live and where we work. And yeah, it's, it's, it's quite exciting to be part of this panel and discussing a few of the challenges and opportunities for, for this sector. Thanks, Phil, that's great. Uh, just uh, a little bit more background on myself. Um, quite different to everybody else on this panel. Um, I'm a garment engineer. I've worked in the sector for over 25 years. I'm late to uh, the, the university uh, industry um, collaboration side, um, started in university um, later in my career. And I'm really passionate about how we can link what we're doing in terms of research and our academic excellence in the UK to supporting um, our industries, our, many of which are SMEs in the sector. So really keen for anybody out there um, who wants to follow up with me or my team at uh, the Manchester Fashion Institute at Manchester Metropolitan University. So that's everybody on the panel for today. You will have opportunities to um, ask us questions. Any that we can't answer today, we will, we will get back to you. So feel free throughout um, this presentation to upload any of your questions. Um, and I'll, I'll kick off the panel. Um, it's gonna be interactive and quite relaxed because we've, uh, we've talked about how we want this to come across to the sector so that it's engaging for you listening, but also that you, know, you get the most out of the session today. Uh, first question is gonna be for you, uh, Dave. Um, you work, your business works across lots of different areas. Um, what, what forms of muscle stimulation are, are currently out there now in the sector? I'm, I'm, I guess to give it context, um, there, there is TENS technology, um, which has been out there for a long time, which is a muscle stimulation technology. Um, uh, but we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of change in the space uh, recently with training, um, training aids largely. I think Kai and Phil will both have um, things to say on this subject as well. But uh, we've also done some interesting work recently with mechanical stimulation. So using, using specific frequencies of mechanical vibration, which is also very promising for um, kind of well-being applications and pain relief. What about you, Phil, I, on your side in terms of muscle stimulation and the work you're doing at Chimera? So... Uh, I guess we, we fall under the more uh, passive technologies with, with what we've been doing. So there's obviously muscle stimulation with, with um, electrical signals. Um, but what we've been doing and what our main technology that's out there at the moment is looking at an infrared emitting technology. So one that's actually, uh, as I said, a passive technology. So it doesn't use any batteries or wires or electronics or things like that. Um, but instead uh, absorbs energy, wasted energy from the wear and ambient light from the surroundings and converts it to far infrared, which uh, possibly some audience members uh, will, will uh, recognize that term or, or its use in infrared saunas or infrared therapy lamps. They're quite popular and, and were very popular uh, back in the day for sports rehabilitation. Um, right. And essentially it's the same principle. You're, you're stimulating the muscle, you're increasing blood flow, you're increasing oxygenation, and able to accelerate performance and recovery. 
And so this is this is the the key technology we've been developing. And this is something that's, as I said, out on the market and being used by uh, all sorts of athletes, from your Olympic gold medalists all the way to your weekend warriors and people who are just interested in keeping fit, increasing their recovery, and just getting better. So Kai, in relation to you then and your academic and your research work, is it really possible to restore function by doing this through muscle stimulation? Is this, you know, from from a research point of view, would you like to discuss to the panel how you feel your work contributes to this area? Uh, yes, the muscle stimulation is uh, a technology or device has existed for quite a long time. Uh, there's uh, strong clinical evidence uh, says, uh, uh, which which is backed by by clinical trials, say functional electric stimulation. So for FES can restore, let's see, for example, for the stroke rehabilitation, which is an area I worked on, can restore the uh, arm leg function um, post stroke. Uh, how it works uh, is. Um, also, in a normal situation, healthy um, a human being, we control activity use of brain, but there's evidence actually when you do the movement, even it's artificial movement enabled, for example, FES, there's a signal a build which you can feed back to the brain, which if you do the intensive exercise, um, for a long time, it will build the new link on the brain or damage uh, the brain, which can be re repaired the link. So yeah, so from that aspect, uh, it is uh, it is scientifically backed. Also, um, Nines, uh, which is a uh, UK um, UK body to publish the, the evidence, uh, make recommendation for the NHS to use the technology. Uh, there's also support so uh, FES should be used to uh, restore the the functional activities. Um, from the business point of view, um, there has been many company sell this type of device and there's a lot of patient has benefited by using this device to regain their functions. So I would say there's pretty strong evidence that it works, uh, but like any or, or most of the medical device, even if it works for most people, it uh, doesn't necessarily work for everyone. So that's why the initial assessment session is very important because there uh, we do find a situation in which the um, technology don't, uh, don't work. Uh, so I think uh, it's important in the initial session to assess whether um, this is the right technology, even with uh, people it works, what is the best uh, program to use uh, together with the device to, to um, optimize the treatment. Okay, brilliant. Um, Dave, um Electro technology is a key priority in the work that your team at Thrive do. How does this uh, requirement to pass current into the body affect the design of high performance electro technologies? Yes, I, I think there's a lot of promise in, in this area. Um, so traditionally, TENS devices, for example, needed a gel or, or a wet electrode to, to pass current into the body. Um, increasingly with silicons and uh, loaded silicons and conductive polymers, uh, even um, conductive textiles, it is possible to um, produce products with dry electrodes that will um, safely uh, pass current into the through the skin and and to trigger those neurons that that stimulate the that activate the muscles. Um, it, it opens up a, a whole new um, set of possibilities in terms of garments and integrating uh, the electrodes into wearable devices. Uh, and I think we'll maybe come onto it and explore it a little bit further, but understanding the position that somebody's um, body is in and the way that they're moving and timing your intervention um, accordingly is um, is sort of particularly promising. So. These things need to become integrated into clothing to um, to be properly useful and, and roll out as um, into products. 
Okay, brilliant. Um, another one then, one for you, Phil. Um, in your world of sports tech, um, where Chimera are operating at, at a senior level, are you seeing a need for new recovery approaches? Um, does this cover the day-to-day -day training and performance, or is it more about injury recovery for your business? So absolutely, uh, this is something that covers both performance and day-to-day. -day. Um, in, in something like sports, where it's so competitive and everyone, all the athletes want that extra bit of edge uh, and just be able to win gold, it's, it's one of those things where you have to look at the entire training regime, uh, almost your entire lifestyle, and look at how uh, you can apply sports tech to improve your performance, improve your recovery. And when we say recovery, um, it's a bit of a technical term in that we're not only talking about injury recovery. Injury is almost the last place you want to be because then you're out for, for several weeks. Your performance naturally might dip or you, if you're not particularly, let's say, younger, you probably won't be able to get to the same peak that you, that you get to. So you want to keep away from injury. So when we say recovery, we're talking about that day in and day out, if you're performing at a maximum level, you know, how does your body recover from that very strenuous activity uh, that you had just performed and being able to go again and again? And the reason you'd want to focus a lot, not just on improving your performance with reps and, and uh, conditioning, but also recovery, is because it's that day-to-day, -day, uh, day in, day out activities that actually builds you up and builds up your performance long-term um, and obviously safeguards you as well from injury. So absolutely, there's, there's always going to be a need for new uh, recovery approaches within the sports industry. Um, and, you know, there are some technologies that's, that come in and out of fashion. Uh, there's a few pseudo technologies that people are interested in and maybe they come in and they're trendy because maybe some athletes uh, use them or what have you, but then they sort of fall out of fashion. Um, so naturally on this, on, on, in, in this place, having anything that's clinically uh, evidence or anything that has that proven to work uh, is, is going to be a, a massive benefit. Um, and, and like electrostimulation being a clinically uh, beneficial technology with many clinical uh, research sort of backing that up, uh, the technology that we've been applying with infrared is also clinically backed. Um, and, and again, that's how we've been able to access some of the, the premiership leagues or the, the top national teams because we're coming in not as a potentially a pseudoscience, but something that's actually backed by, by evidence. And that's really worked for us. So Kai, Kai, then, in terms of muscle stimulation and sensing going hand in hand to create biofeedback, what are your views on the benefits of deploying this? And uh, could, could you give the, the audience some examples of, of how this actually happens? Um, I think uh, uh, because uh, stimulation is uh, used to strengthen muscle in general, and restore the movement. Where on the other hand, uh, the um, the sensory, let's say for example, the the ECG, EEG, EMG, um, which you can be used to give the indicate about the biopotential function. By bringing these two together, um, personally, I think the, the one of the biggest benefit is uh, um, it closes the loop. It provides the user how they are getting on with the, with their recovery. Because once somebody told me they were quite exciting when they say actually you can see the the muscle movement. Uh, also, um, he's in the very early stage, uh, wasn't able to kind of do the movement uh, um, completely rely on the uh, muscle. But because uh, he saw there's uh, there's kind of start to strengthen the muscle. This kind of information is very important to to the patient because it gives the them the hope actually there's something change something is going in the right direction so that is very good motivation both for for sports fitness in general uh, because we, we we tend to do more when we know what's going on and it's a particular uh, even more important for uh, for rehabilitation recovery um, some example for for example with the, the FES muscle stimulation uh, if we say with the EMG work together, it can inform the end user how they are getting on with, with their activity, um, the muscle recovery, how strongly it becomes. Uh, it will motivate the user to, to use it more. 
uh, as used more because it's uh, uh, rehabilitation is through the intensive practice, uh, which the intensive um, component is very important. So it will enable them to do more. Um, even with uh, another example is, uh, for example, the FES work together with the EEG, which is for uh, brain uh, signal measurement. There has to be a kind of parallel for technology. For example, when you have a stroke, it's, it sounds crazy, but uh, uh, it is true. If you think about uh, the activity you want to do through this imagination, actually it contributes uh, to the recovery of the neural system. Um, if you, if you let's think about scenario, which you, through decoding the EEG signal, we can work out what is the patient's intention, what activity they would like to do. Uh, then use the FES to trigger the stimulus. Actually, they can, they can imagine it at the same time, they can do the rehabilitation activity. Bring those two technologies together, um, I think it uh, will bring more hope, uh, make the treatment more, more effective. Uh, uh, so I think it's uh, it, it's a trend uh, um, for the future development because uh, by bringing those te technology together, they can serve different needs, uh, and it's also provide the potential for the, for example, the remote uh, monitoring um, because uh, the healthcare professional or the coach could uh, think how people are getting on with their recovery or rehabilitation process. So. Yeah, that's uh, great. Well, I know you're in agreement on this one, uh, Dave, because I can see you nodding your head, but I know you've got years of experience working um, uh, on the design side of this. So for you, really, what technologies work alongside EMS to enhance rehabilitation and recovery applications in, in your experience? Um, yeah, yeah, I think we're particularly sort of excited um, uh, about the possibilities when we start combining um, the FES technology in particular, but um, uh, EMS in general, with um, synergistic uh, technologies. And I would very much put Phil's, um, the, the, the work that Chimera do um, in with that. So, you know, looking at the, uh, looking at the research that um, is behind the Chimera um, far infrared emitting um, ceramic loaded textiles. Um, uh, the, in, in our interpretation, the, the, the recovery that Phil spoke about in terms of um, training recovery for, for athletes is, is a, does blur into other areas of recovery. We know that there's clinical evidence that it, um, it supports um, healing as well, um, potentially. So, uh, and, and what Kai was just talking about then, which is um, when you combine, um, when you're able to bring in sort of visualization tools to help with um, a person's recovery. Um, so uh, feeling that the muscle is doing something and understanding visually um, how that works and, and being able to visualize a future situation where that limb is moving properly again perhaps with the help of technology and, and CGI and, and things like that we're, we're particularly interested and we've had some great discussions with um, with collaborators and potential collaborators in these areas where we combine things together but I would say you know just to kind of run through a list inertial measurement units you know accelerometer type things uh, 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 easily integratable into garments now and so it's possible to know how a limb is moving relative to another and, and to actually build a full picture of how a whole body is moving and as I mentioned earlier timing um, kind of targeted interventions uh, using muscle stimulation brings a whole um, world of possibilities really in, in terms of um, the work that Kai is doing uh, in particular, but there, there are lots of other sort of similar and parallel activities that we know about where we see that space opening up. I mean, please jump in, Phil and Kai. Um, yeah. 
I think that's why it's particularly exciting at the moment is because of the fusion of, of this um, intervention technology with the um, sensing technologies that are available and being able to fuse the, the, um, the analysis that's coming in from all of these sensors into something meaningful that you can then act on with the muscle stimulation um, opens up really big possibilities. So what's yeah. new? What's new, for you, Phil, for you in your world in relation to what Dave's outlined? You know, what's the new yeah, direction I, for Chimera? Well, I, I'll 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 take it in two parts. So definitely, I agree with with Dave that we're we're coming to the point where um, just having a, a single tool, if you were, that's giving you one measurement or one data point back mm -hmm. on, um, is, is no longer cuts it. Um, you talk enough. to professional coaches. You, you talk to trainers. Um, it's not just about providing more data. It is from a, from a software algorithmic point of view, you wanna be able to measure all sorts of data points um, and apply all sorts of different uh, methodology for recovery or performance monitoring, and then double back on yourself and make sure that they're doing what you're expecting. But then the, the humans, the coaches, the trainers who are there, uh, you know, who have full schedules and are trying to basically decide how are they gonna deal with a 22 man squad or a 42 man squad, depending on your team, uh, you know, they just want the insight. They want to be able to say, right, okay, I'm, I've got some system telling me to do X, and this is the level of confidence it's, it's giving me. And, and we all know um, in the sort of computer science space, to be able to give that level of confidence, um, you're going to need more data. So in terms of the data fusion, absolutely agree. In terms of combining different methodologies into, a, let's say, a single service offering, a single packet, makes absolute business sense. Um, and that sort of segues me uh, right into what we're doing with Chimera, which is we are looking at uh, smart garment technologies that are actually combining a whole source, host of different sensors and different capabilities in there. Because again, you can buy individual systems uh, that don't talk to each other, but then you're losing a lot of insight and then you're relying on the coaches and physios to actually take all that data and actually act on it. And the reality is that doesn't really happen anymore. There's, there's too much going on. Um, so you need to be able to look at uh, a single service offering or a single solution that's giving you all of that insight. So Kai, um, Kai how does academia and research respond to this? Because the industrial people on the panel are saying it needs to be a much broader approach. Uh, universities tend to silo their research. So how can we respond to what the sector needs? We are working very hard to keep in the speed uh, with, the, with the requirement, you got to say. Um, yeah, I totally agree with uh, Phil Dave. Uh, it's, uh, it's become more, more connected a uh, uh, whole system uh, uh, which can serve the end user needs. Um, uh, for example, we, we used to focus only on, on the because with research, it's always good to start with somewhere to see works before you build the whole system. Uh, but we totally agree, for example, with, with the pain relief, uh, even stroke rehabilitation, what we did is, uh, yeah, we, we need to, to build a system, demonstrate it work. Uh, then we need to add the functions. Uh, one example is, uh, we start with uh, this, this field, if you might know, we, did, we started with uh, uh, wearable tents, uh, um, which is to improve the usability and the um, if, um, effectiveness through the electronic part. Um, then we, we think about uh, what really matters to the end user. For example, they want to know how much they can bend their knee, how much activity they have done. So we develop a, a, a young form electronic sensor, which is embedded the paradigm form of the electronic component in a, in a thin, long, young, and we can move into the textile, which you provide a kind of invisible integration to this measurement. And um, because uh, we, we think, uh, um, yeah, end user, you need to make uh, as easy as possible all the complicated uh, technology uh, should go just behind uh, when you present to the end user. It, uh, need to be something well designed, a simple use. That's why we, we work with companies uh, um, yeah, like uh, Chimera, Strive Wearables, because we don't have that expertise, but we know there's a need. So we work uh, with the debris orders together and, and also 
at the so, technology in the recent parts. So, Kai, do you think the e-textile network then could support the sector because it brings together lots of different academic research in this area in the UK as the collective? Do you think it's able to support what the industry sector needs? Uh, yes, so I think e-textile network is a very uh, timely um, kind of platform. Uh, because uh, we 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 are working in academia, we also have some link with industry. Because, we, as I mentioned, we, we got some um, uh, interest in the you know companies like startups, the art company uh, we formed. So, so we we know that there will be. We talk different language. We have different priority, and but I think in the end, we all have the same goal is we want to develop something useful. So with the textile network, uh, it uh, brings uh, together all the technology developers, regardless they are from industry or um, academia or the end user sector. Uh, so with this, we are able to share the knowledge. We are not try not to repeat the same mistake. Uh, we are built on the great technology others already have. Uh, to have uh, not a shortcut, but a more straight uh, kind of towards the what we deliver. So in textile network, uh, we the main activity, for example, we send a newsletter including all those uh, um, new developments uh, in the area. We sign posts to find the opportunities, uh, collaboration required, uh, and also we have uh, annual conference, national conference. So I think it's a great platform uh, to, uh, yeah, uh, Okay, well, to that's, work that together. should be good. That should be good news for for the audience. So um, you'll be able to connect with Kai on that. Uh, one then for you, Phil. Uh, not a lot of companies have managed. There's been a lot of research, but actually taking the research and putting it into action in terms of developing electronic fabric technologies from a prototype in a lab to real life in production. Um, tell us how complicated that's been for Chimera and how long's the journey been. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting challenge, really, because I think again, coming from a from an electronic engineering background, I think that the while it's a challenging bit of technological work to actually implement it, um, it's the one stumbling block that that we in this sort of market sector have had is really the application and trying to find that application, that winner application that's actually motivating investors, uh, motivating people to invest time and energy into actually developing a product. Because um, a lot of work has happened in, in industry over the over the last couple of decades. That's that's no doubt. Um, but it's that step, taking it from lab to uh, manufacturing to marketing, which is arguably a really expensive bit of work. Usually there isn't that much public funding available for this kind of work. There is some, but not as much as, as for example, for rudimentary or, or or early stage research and so a lot of companies are a bit hesitant to go for it if they don't find the, that killer application um, and we've seen uh, companies uh, come and go actually in this field as well simply because they couldn't find that application um, so for Chimera our journey really started in earnest in 2016 where we uh, where we won our first Innovate UK application um, looking at uh, in incorporating electronics into some sort of garment assembly and since then, we've been able to leverage that with investment. We've been able to use uh, our current sportswear revenue to actually fund our R&D. So a lot of it has kind of been on our own back to, to really push it forward and really finding the application or let's say the killer application to do it. Personally, we feel that it's professional sports and it's medical, really. Mass market is, is interesting, but mass market is very tough. A lot of companies that, that aren't here anymore, they've they've gone through the, the whole, okay, let's try to develop something that pleases everyone. But you try to please everyone, you don't please anyone. Um, and, and really that's the challenge. So for us, the biggest thing has been being able to navigate that market and figuring out, okay, where do we actually want to invest our time and resources, which is a bit challenging when you don't have, you know, several hundreds of millions in a bank account. <laughs> So, so, Dave, would you agree with Phil in relation to the two areas where he sees the potential for the technology to apply itself? Um, yes, I, I think I, I'm fairly kind of long in the tooth as well in this, this area because um, 
I co-founded uh, a company that um, was venture capital backed uh, and it was set up in 1998. And this was, as, as I mentioned before, we put a conductive textile um, product, which was essentially like a touch screen in, in fabric, but a uh, um, long, long way back. And, and we, we sort of fought various battles to get the textile industry to, to produce things um, to consistent tolerances that were suitable for a consumer electronics product and then you know a hundred thousand uh, flexible keyboards that wrapped around a palm pda if you can remember what one of those is <laughs> um w were produced under license uh, for logitech uh, and we worked with levi's and nokia and microsoft and, and lots of other companies i think the the fundamental problem that the um that the kind of investment caused it was heavily invested through venture capital um was a drive to sell lots of consumer electronics products, even though that wasn't really the, that's not really the right space for this technology. So um, I, absolutely, Phil, and uh, we, we've had a lot of discussions with Phil in the past as well, and, and we, we know that we share the same view uh, on this already, but um, if you're going to use textiles in a product, um, especially conductive textiles in specialist applications, make sure you can't do it any other way as a very first step, you know, will a flex circuit do it, et cetera, et cetera. And it's these kinds of applications in medical and um, garment integrated um, applications where it has to be, for example, the subject that we're talking about now, um, then yes, it, it's absolutely a suitable technology for that. If it's just a flexible circuit that you need, um, really try and think of some other <laughs> some other way to do it first. So our, our approach here is, you know, over the years you develop a lot of um, kind of tools and techniques that can be applied to, um, uh, to integrate things uh, according to what's needed. So, um, you know, sooner or later it ends up with a, a PCB at some point if you're gonna, if you're gonna make a sort of reasonably complex circuit. And, and therefore, you've got hard lumps to sort of integrate alongside your your flexible stuff. And there, there are various sort of tried and tested techniques for sort of managing that and making sure that it's um, robust and washable and, and things like that as well. But these are all these are all um, hurdles that have been overcome through uh, much struggle in in some ways <laughs> back in the day when it was all unknown. So in terms of struggle, this is this is a key one really for you, Kai, because both of the boys reckoned this was a question for you. In terms of regulatory uh, requirements, um, particularly when you're working with stimulating muscles, um, it's high risk. Um, do you see any changes coming in this area? There's a lot of ethics involved around what you're going to be able to do. Um, what's your view as a leading academic in this area? Um, I might want to disagree. Actually, I don't think it's uh, it's it's high risk uh, for muscle stimulation. Okay, good. Uh, because, uh, um, as I said, uh, the muscle stimulation device has been there uh, for quite a long time. Um, people use it to benefit from the treatment. Uh, there's a very rare case, uh, uh, see, kind of report the damage. Uh, um, on the other hand, uh, there's a kind of very rigorous uh, uh, regulatory you yeah. need to uh, meet in order to put your uh, product uh, on the market. Uh, for example, they have, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of, it's, it's, it's quite a lot of technical uh, work need to do to test based on, for example, um, start with the, or just data collected in the lab to uh, for example, the, the, how robust it is, uh, make sure it's uh, biocompatible or not uh, harm kind of bring any damage to the skin. The current level shouldn't be exceed a certain level. Um, and also, especially for home use, there's another set of uh, uh, complicated, uh, very rigorous tests you need to go through in order to, for home use. Um, so, Personally, I'm very confident by the by meeting those um, requirement, uh, which you, some people see it as a barrier, but actually I think it's a responsible way for the manufacturer, for the government to do 
and it's because by uh, by test according to those requirements, uh, um, to the end you pre place somebody on um, something on the market that's a place that uh, yeah you already prove it, it's safe. Uh, um, so I, I think. Um, the regulatory proof is the rigorous process. As long as you for, follow those uh, doses correctly, I think it uh, will eliminate any any potential risk. Uh, so, uh, so for you, Phil, commercially, then what does that mean? There's a lot of regulations, and I know you work internationally. So, in terms of what you have to do in the UK and Europe, and what you have to do internationally, you know, how does this whole regu regulatory um, process affect a business like yours that's a small business? Yeah, I, I would say that in terms of your dedicated effort, <laughs> you, you end up quite quickly ramping up how much how much time you put into the regulatory side of things. I mean, um, you know, developing a technology that works is, is only a, a small part of the whole battle, especially when you're trying to have global reach. You know, we've, we've got different regulations, UKU currently following uh, medical device regulations, we've got FDA out in the States, and, you know, every country or region will have their own rules. Thankfully, however, uh, there is a, a, a consorted effort to have what are known as harmonized standards to make sure that uh, what's, what's valid in one country is usually valid in another. So that's one good thing. So you're not having to start from scratch every, every time you go, you go to try to get a device out on the market. Um, but it is, it is challenging for a small company with not that much uh, resource or, or, or backing or even experience with quality assurance and quality management that relates to medical devices. It, it can be quite a daunting task. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something we're going to right now actually as, as a sort of pain point, but uh, we're doing pretty well. Um, sort of had to take on the role as quality manager for the company as well as chief Techn technology officer, but hey, that's, that's how it goes. Um, but we're building a really, really good system. And, you know, the good thing is you're always going to have audits. You're always going to have people looking at you, making sure you're doing it right. And they're not there to, to make you stumble. They're, they're there to make sure that whatever you're developing is safe. So at least, you know, you're not having necessarily to do it alone. Um, you certainly need to have some, some, you know, money tucked aside to be able to dedicate towards it. So yeah, as a, from a business perspective, if you're going to develop or want to go into the medical industry, start getting your quality management uh, sort of ASAP, it, it will save you a lot of hassle and redevelopment work in the long run. I think I, I would also contribute, if I may. Um, yeah, yeah, little, far away. There are certain things that you can do by design, and this is where integrating into garments um, comes in. So um, just for safety reasons alone, you want to be integrating all the kind of cabling and wiring and not have external cables that could become detached and and cause problems. Um, there are various things um, that point towards making sure that everything is kind of cleanly um, integrated within um, sort of the garment and can't be tampered with. Um, I understand you also need to avoid uh, um, passing current across the body where it could potentially end up going through the heart. Um, and so uh, you know, just making a kit where you could place electrodes anywhere obviously isn't gonna isn't gonna work. Uh, there are there are precedents out there as well. There are FDA approved devices in this space already, um, and so uh, you know, as as Kai said, there's there's a pretty long track record of of devices that are out there and have been proven safe over time. So um, th there is there is a starting place for the development of even quite new technology, as long as the right design principles are, are followed. Okay. So panel, I'll just, I will have to, I'll, I'll have to move us on actually, because we're gonna run out of time on the end. We have a, a key question that I'm really interested in uh, the panel. We've got two members of the panel from academia, two from industry. I'll start with you, Dave. Uh, what's, what's your view on getting great academic work into world changing products? How, how do we connect or how should we be connecting? Um, and how can we, as a sector, support what you're doing um, in this space? Um, we work quite frequently with, with academia on, on very specialist um, applications. So we tend to um, 
we have a network and so we we tend to kind of browse for um particularly relevant expertise in in particular areas and then set up some kind of shared destiny um collaboration where we um where it's relatively easy to find things to find situations where we can both benefit we, we both get out of the relationship do you find the same phil yeah i agree i think collaboration with with uh, research and academic institutions is the way to go. I think that, you know, th there was an idea back in the day where, you know, only the biggest companies, the most valuable companies did cutting edge R&D that changed the world and what have you. But realistically in this day and age, uh, I think all universities need to, to get on board and become quite entrepreneurial with the way they, they deal with the research. Because sometimes I'll deal with universities and come here, we deal with loads of different universities. Um, we'll deal with universities who are on it and they can see the potential and we can quickly get past any red tape and any any really exciting cutting edge research can immediately look at getting transferred to industry for the benefit of both the university, the academics and the business. But there are others who kind of still seem to be stuck in, in the old days where, you know, it was research and academia for research and academia's sake and publishing papers and not really taking it forward, which some some amazing cutting edge research. It's a real shame when essentially it just gets uh, lost to just papers and journals and doesn't actually exit uh, the academic space. So I would definitely encourage any research institution to really get on get on the on the boat and and work with smaller companies, not the biggest ones in the world. Work with smaller companies and and help to push out new products based on really exciting research. I, I would also just, if I may, just add. Um, the timing of when to of when to collaborate with companies like ourselves or or Chimera um, to take something forward is 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 really important. We we see a lot of really exciting in five years time technologies that might or might not um, come to fruition in that sort of time scale, but um, we're also interested in fairly um, in fairly near term uh, implementable technologies so we've got a series of um pretty organized steps that we go through it's quite a lean process where for fairly short amount of, uh, fairly small amounts of of um of money in terms of a project cost we can establish the feasibility in in quite rough and ready um ways and then uh it it brings in investment to the next stage and, and we can take it forward and then we we go through if if you look on our website we've got a series of kind of um established steps that we go through all the way from idea through to production and it doesn't need to be a kind of hugely costly process and we can also take it step by step to match in with um stakeholder investment into the project Okay, um, and with that, I would, um, we'll, this will just finish our session now in terms of the questions, and uh, the, then um, the panel will take questions from the floor. Uh, I'm now, then panel, I'm now going to go on and summarise what we've actually done so they can do a split. Okay, so in summary, um, the session today, uh, we've discussed current academic and uh, thinking and research related to muscle stimulation for rehabilitation and recovery. Um, on the panel, we have had uh, two representatives from the academic community from the University of Southampton and from Manchester Metropolitan University. And uh, a design development business um, who are actually sponsoring the panel today and uh, an innovative sportswear business, uh, Chimera. Um, the team have considered what the opportunities are for health and what their businesses and their own uh, and their academic institutional institutions, uh, personal approaches have been from the areas that they operate in. Um, and I'd just like to ask each of the panel uh, in terms of, you know, where they're operating, um, what, what do they want out of the panel discussion today? And I'll start with you, Kai. Um, the outcome for you and your university in Southampton, what, what do you want to say to the audience? Thank you very much. Um, as I said, we have worked on electronic textile for over 10 years, 
our key expertise is on the um, functional materials, including print, electronic inks, uh, manufacture process, and we work on uh, a lot of uh, applications. And today is just a kind of a, a small fraction of the work uh, we are doing. So we collaborate with the industry uh, quite often. So please do reach out uh, if you think uh, we can help. Uh, enjoy the e-textile network because that's a great place to find the resource uh, and uh, yeah, keep, keep uh, informed uh, what's new in the area. And, Thank and thanks, Kai, that's great. Uh, over to you, Phil, then. What do you want to say to anybody watching? Well, firstly, thanks very much for listening to us all, all, all speak to you for, for the last 40 minutes or so. Um, it's, you know, it's a really exciting time. Chimera are, are uh, relatively early days, but developing all sorts of different technologies. Uh, we love collaborating with other SMEs and universities and academic institutions. Um, not only do we do a lot of development ourselves, but we also uh, have roots to market with our current revenue generating sports here. So it's, it, it puts us in a quite interesting position. And yeah, just generally, you know, um, we're quite approachable a bunch of people. So if you want to get in touch, if you have some ideas for collaboration or different synergies, just yeah, um, my details are on are on uh, the landing page, uh, giant, the, the giant conference and, and what have you. And yeah, in general, just enjoy the rest of your conference. It's, it's going to be an interesting one. And last but not least, Dave, over to you. Um, yeah, we're, we're just interested in connections in this space. Um, we've already been involved with a number of clients um, in this area. Um, we have internal, our own internal um, innovation work progressing as well. Um, our mission is about uh, ec creating exponential gains in health and well-being, and that's um, that's what we're looking for collaborations um, in that in that area but we we see this area as particularly um, exciting uh, just now it's it, it feels like a tipping point and so we're just opening up the discussion really and see what happens brilliant that's great Dave and um, as as far as um, myself and the team at Manchester Fashion Institute we're garment engineers uh, we're we're experts in anthropometrics size and fit um, and we're really interested in the uh, development of wearable technology within clothing because that's our area of expertise so on behalf of Thrive Wearables and the team at Giant uh, everybody on the panel would um, welcome uh, feedback from anybody out there if you think anybody on the panel are able to help any of your businesses and be a cost benefit for you thanks very much